Today's scripture reading will be taken from Romans 1, 14 through 16. 1, 14 through 16. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. My mic on, that's a little bit better. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> so it's good to be out with you tonight. It's good to see you all. Um, you know, we were talking about the, the weather there very briefly uh, on our way over here because, you know, we were walking over and starting to sweat a little bit from that, that heat that came through. It's 90 degrees again. Uh, so, you know, that's just God wanting us to be hot, not cold, not lukewarm, okay? So that's what the heat's all about. Uh, but let's, let's be on fire for God. Let's be all about him. So tonight we're going to be talking about these three I am statements of Paul. <clears throat> you know, off, uh, oftentimes whenever we think of the I am statements, we think about, uh, we think about John. Uh, we think about the, all the, the seven I am statements that uh, Christ had made about himself uh, in that passage. Um, but Paul, in this passage, he, he's, he's got some I am statements as well. And these are things that, you know, we can see these things about Paul, and, and these are things that we could also incorporate into our lives as Christians as well. These three statements, if we truly reflect on these things, as we will tonight, then we'll notice that these are something, some statements that we should be able to make about ourselves as well. And so I hope that as we go through this, we can make some uh, correlation to ourselves and we can grow from this and we can either, at the end of the lesson, make these I am statements or resolve to be able to make these statements. Uh, that way we can be imitators of Christ uh, as we ought to be. So in this passage, we see uh, in Romans uh, chapter 1, and uh, thank you, Colby, for reading that last minute. He had like two minutes to, to prepare for it and uh, appreciate that. But, uh, you know, in these statements, in this passage, you know, we see how Paul is, is, is talking about these, all these things, and he, he wants to... Uh, he wants to impart this to us. He wants this to be something that, uh, that the Romans, uh, those that were in Rome there, that they understood as well. You know, Rome, uh, he was a, a cit citizen of Rome as well. He was not just a Jew, but he had citizenship. And this is something that, you know, was sought after in that time. This is something that was of high value because it cost a high price as well. There were many in that time that would work and try to earn enough and to save up enough to purchase uh, Roman citizenship. And if you were lucky, then you could have been born in the right place and you could have been uh, born a citizen. Um, but it's something that had some benefits to it. And so it's odd that the first thing that we see that Paul is saying about himself is that he's a debtor, that he is uh, someone that is indebted to somebody else when he is a Roman citizen. He's free. You could not be a citizen of Rome and be a, a servant or a slave. You had to be a free servant uh, to, in order to have the opportunity to purchase that. So there's no way that uh, to be a Roman citizen and to be indebted, a, a debtor that those two things, those two things, you know, clashed. But he was Saul of Tarsus. He was born in the right place. There at a time he had some privileges associated with that. You know, he was. Uh, he had the privilege to vote. He had the privilege to enter into contracts. He could purchase land. He could do all these different things. Um, one of the things that he could do is he was allowed to go into the Colosseum as well. He could uh, go for the entertainment that was there. <clears throat> he was not supposed to be beaten whenever he was uh, taken as prisoner. There were several things that was a privilege of Roman citizenship. And one of the things that brought him to Rome was... The citizenship, he said that I appeal to Caesar. He had the right to appeal whatever judgment had been made. And he could kind of go through that chain uh, of, of all that. And so we see that he has all of this, this privilege here, but yet he's considering himself a debtor. 
Why is he considering himself this way? Why does he consider himself a debtor? Because he was freed from that, that slavery, that bondage of sin. He was freed. You know, what, what was he doing prior to this? What was he partaking in actively? He was going and persecuting the Christians. He was going around and doing all kinds of terrible acts. But we know that even though he did all of those things, it was finally time for him to be that chosen vessel that Christ said that he was. He said he was a chosen vessel in Acts. And so he came out of that. Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, you know, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, isn't it? And this, as this was revealed to him through Ananias and he was baptized and he had this, his whole conversion story and all the things that he, he did prior to him being converted, there was so much that he had done that he felt an obligation to those that had called him out of that sin. He felt an obligation to Christ who had bestowed upon him this new privilege, this new privilege of being indebted to Christ for saving him because he saved his life. He saved his eternal soul. And because of that, he considered himself in, bond, in bondage, a, a debtor, someone who owed something to someone. He owes something to God, even though he's a free man. Here in America, we are all born free. We all have these you know, rights as a citizen. We all have the ability to do all kinds of different things. And, and that's just because of the place that we're, we're born in. That's, that's, you know, we're, we're very blessed. We're very lucky to have been born in an area like this that ha gives us all these benefits. But we also should consider ourselves as debtors. We also should consider ourselves uh, as, as owing something to Christ in order that we might be better at doing what he would have us to do. In 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn with me there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll see a little bit of maybe Paul's reasoning behind this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19, it says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who were under the law as those who were under the law, that I might win those who were under the law. To those who were without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers of it with you. So we get to see a little bit of his reasoning behind this and why he considers himself a debtor. Because he wants to spread the gospel. He, he wants so badly to do this that he does everything within his power, within his ability to do that. He adapts to whatever situation and whatever climate, whatever area that he's in. He tries to uh, you know, get with these individuals and try to find some common ground so that way he can identify with them, so that way he can level with them, so that way he can you know, find some sort of way that he can present Christ to them, so that way they also can be saved for the, from their eternal punishment that they would otherwise go to. He says, I've done this so much that I might win some. He knows and he understands that there's only going to be some that are saved. And we know that from you know, when, when Jesus is talking about the wide gate and the, and the narrow gate and the, the narrow way. That there's going to be many that enter into the wide gate that leads to destruction. And only few are going to find that narrow gate, that narrow way that leads to life. Paul understands that, and we should also understand that. But we shouldn't be widening the gate to that leads to destruction, right? We need to try and narrow it down. We need to be standing in front of that gate. We need to be trying to get people, hey, no, you should be taking this path over here. And trying to win souls over for him, for, for Christ, for God, because that's what we ought to do, because we owe it to him. We are, inde we are uh, indebted to him for saving us. You know, we were going over this a little bit last week, and I broke down too much, and I couldn't get my point out, and I want to try to do it again tonight about this, um, and how, you know, we can be thankful for those people in our lives that have done so much for us, that have helped us out in our lives. Took a nap, a better nap than I did last week, so I feel like I can get through it emotionally. <laughs> but
but one of the things that you know, we should think about is that we're indebted to those people who took the time to teach us, right? We're indebted to those individuals who spent time trying to cultivate and nurture a relationship in us with God. And one of those things that took place back in 1977 when uh, my grandfather passed away, I never got to meet uh, on my mom's side, never got to meet my grandfather or grandma. <clears throat> Man, I'm already getting emotional. I'm terrible at this. But there was uh, some individuals that attended church with them that when they had, uh, when their mom and dad had passed away, I got two aunts and my mom. Those were the three children that were born to uh, George and, and Wanda Fordyce. And so these three children, after the death of their father, who their mother had passed away prior to that, they were left at the funeral home. People were emotional. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where just they weren't thought of. They were just little kids. And so they left. Everyone left from the funeral home. And the funeral home director had contacted Carl, who had been uh, you know, someone who was at uh, the, uh, the congregation there, the Church of Christ. He knew him. He, he you know, had good standing. He, he's one of those individuals that was very outgoing and very, uh, very good for the, the cause of Christ. He was an elder uh, at that church there, too. And so he got a phone call, and he said, hey, there's these three kids here, you know, and we're, you're the first person we thought of that could come and pick them up. And so he picked them up, and they got a hold of the family, and the family was kind of like at a loss for who's going to take these children. Nobody was equipped enough to be able to take on three kids all at once. They weren't ready for that. And so they were like debating amongst the family members. They were saying, okay, well, yeah, we can take this one, we can take that one, and we can take this one, and they'll all be taken care of. Well, Carl's like, no, you, you know, we'll keep a hold of them for as long as we need to figure it all out. Um, so you guys just decide on, on, on all those things. And because of that, because of, <clears throat> because of them doing that, you know, we had a relationship with them. And that's a good thing, right? We need people that are willing to stand up and, and stick their neck out and to, to help out to these individuals. Did they... Did they owe it to these children to do that? No, but they did owe it to God to do what they could. That's what we should do as well. We all are indebted to God to do the best that we possibly can. There we go. I got it out. <laughs> Not too many tears. Am I ready to preach? You know, in, in these times, you know, Paul... Was, he says he's ready to preach. He, he's ready. He's, he's, he's prepared. He's, he's, you know, he's got knowledge. He was trained uh, in, in the old law. He was trained in all those things. He, he was ready to preach. You know, he had that advantage w in regards to that knowledge because he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, and, you know, he, he knew his stuff. He talked about how he was one of the leaders of that current time, how, you know, all his contemporaries, he, they, they were underneath of him. He was better than them. But he gave all that, that up for Christ. But he had an advantage in, in regards to that. And also, if you'll turn to uh, John uh, 14 and 26... John 14 and 26, let's actually read 25 as well. It says, uh, John, Jesus is saying, These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And also in Matthew uh, chapter 10 and verse 19. Matthew 10 and verse 19 It says, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Okay, so here's a couple of things that we can see and we can realize, okay, the apostles kind of had an advantage, right? You know, Paul kind of had an advantage. But we're to be this way as well. We're to be able to say, I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to do this. You know, he had to at least prepare himself mentally to go through those things and to do those things. But whenever he was in that moment, you know, the Holy Spirit 
was there with him, was causing him to be able to say the right thing at the right time and do all these things worked in him. You know, we don't have that advantage. We don't have that going for us necessarily, right? But what we do have the ability to do is to cultivate courage, is to build that up within us, and to be ready to give an answer for the, thing, for the hope that's within us. We need to be able to cultivate and nurture that and, and grow in our in courage to, to do that. Are we doing that? Am I doing that? You know, before you know, I get up here, usually I take a few minutes to try and jot down some notes to try and remember the things that I've done. And there will be some times where, like, you know, I, I, self-evaluation, I'm, I'm, like, you know, going in. I'm hitting on some points. I'm going really good. And then all of a sudden, I try to switch gears, and I, I drop the clutch, and I stall out, and, you know, I lose my place. I forget what I was about to say, and, you know, the moment's lost. And that's not the case with, with Paul, but that's something that we have to struggle with. That's something that we have to, uh, to, to, to try and overcome. But it's something that we need to work at every single day. So do we have the knowledge that we should have? Let's turn to, to Peter. We'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. And then we'll turn to Second Peter as well. First Peter chapter three and verse 15. It says, "Sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to anyone, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear." And then also Second Peter chapter two. It says, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteous. Who is, uh, that's, did I read the right verse? Second Peter 3.18. Oh, that's my problem. I didn't read it right. 3.18. It says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So we need to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is something that we have to dedicate our, ourselves to. We have to dedicate time to. You know, it's not just going to be imbued upon us. We're not going to be, become a Christian and all of a sudden just, you know, be enlightened, be awakened in our mind like, okay, I've just accepted all the knowledge of God and of, of Christ and the Holy Spirit is now working within me and I have all these things. No, what we see here is that the Christian life, as we step out, as th this is something that we step into, that we we, we our, you know, we take that first step into Christ, become baptized in him, in his name. And then from there on, it's dedication. It's something that we work towards. It's something that takes patience. It's something that takes a lot of effort. We don't just get these gifts blessed to us immediately. It's going to take time. And it's something that we should reflect on. Am, am I working towards, am I am I? Am I better today than what I was yesterday? Am I working towards a goal right now, or am I just taking it easy? You know, when you are hiking up a mountain, you know, gravity is working against you. And when you stand still, when you try to just stop and stand there, what's, what's, trying, what's happening at that moment? You're falling back. You know, gravity is trying to pull you down that hill. It takes effort to make it up that hill, and that's what I think we should imagine in our Christian life is that we are always constantly working uphill. We're trying to, to, to rise up above, you know, all the, the sinful worldliness, the, the, all that, the stuff that we should be abstaining from should be, you know, not be tempted towards. We should, we're working our way up towards God. But as soon as we stop, gravity is going to start taking its effect. It's going to cause us to start backsliding. We should be having that mentality when it comes to our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, constantly growing. Not any one of us here, that whenever we were baptized, do we know everything there was to know about Christ. You know, you could ask anyone. But it's something that we've grown over time. It's, you know, that the ability to, to know what took place here and there and, you know, what teachings Christ had given us in this moment in my life. What, you know, how is this going to help me? in this moment in my life, or by teaching somebody. That's something that takes time. But we need to start giving Christ our time 
diving into the scriptures in order to accumulate that knowledge. And it takes that courage to do that. Do we do that? Do we have that patience and courage and, and offering of our time? If not, if we're not ready to preach, then why not? And we should be working towards being able to say, I am ready to preach. I am ready to teach. He said, the third thing that he said is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel in verse 16. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not embarrassed by the word of God. I'm not one of these people that's going to hide away from this because of the, the rest of the world, the way that they're doing things, the way that they, they, they say these things. You know, one of the things that I noticed whenever I was looking up some uh, things about Roman citizenship is that there was a right given to men. Um, you know, they were allowed to do all those other things that I mentioned beforehand, but one of the things they were allowed to do was that they could choose to end a child's life if they, you know, one of their own child's children's lives. If they decided, no, this one is not, not worth it. There's defects or there's this or there's that. Not worth it or whatever the case may be. That's something that was taking place in his time. What about today? You know, we have that same kind of thing happening today. That's, that's, that's in complete, uh, you know, it's completely against what God would say. God values every single life, doesn't he? Every single life he values. And he's been long-suffering and patient all the way till now with us, for all of us. And for all those children that are here, that are outside of these walls as well, God is still being long-suffering and patient that they might come to know him. Because, because of that. And that's, that's what we shouldn't be ashamed of. We should not be ashamed of God. We should not be ashamed of the gospel we shouldn't be ashamed of all these things. And yet, Satan has done a very good job of turning the world against God, turning the world against Christians. Whenever you watch movies or uh, TV shows or whatever, one of the things that uh, whenever a, a Christian character is being portrayed in these things, I, I remember watching uh, this, you know, the, the, the movie The Mist there was, and reading that book as well. They had this character in there who was a Christian. And that person was just just nuts. They, they were off the wall. Why was this person being portrayed like this? Why, you know, why do they always portray Christians as, as being these ridiculous zealots that go too far and, and, and on all this? Well, there seems to be an agenda. There seems to be a reason behind it. That they want people to be against Christianity for some reason, whatever it might be. There's a lot of individuals like that. The media as well is that way. You know, we, we can tell, we can see this nowadays that whenever people are being interviewed and they're talking about their faith, they're talking about God, they're talking about their beliefs, what do they tend to do? Well, this is the time to cut to commercial and you don't get to see that person's interview because they start talking about God and how we should turn back to him. There's, there's people that are not ashamed of the gospel. But whenever I say that, am I saying the truth? If I'm to say I'm not ashamed of the gospel, am I telling the truth or am I lying? It's one of the things that we need to ask ourselves. We need to be proud of that gospel. We need to go out into the world and share it. So am I doing those things? Am I doing what I ought to do? And discuss these three things, and very briefly, I know this, this lesson's not a very long lesson. I forgot to set my timer up here, so I usually have been going off by, by that. But we see these three statements, that I'm a debtor, I'm ready to preach, or I am not ashamed of the gospel. Can we say these three statements? Can we say any one of these statements, and they be true? Hopefully we can grow from that. You know, this is one of those things where God is patient, God is kind, he's, he's forgiving. If we can't say to any of these things or to any one of these things, I can't say that in full honesty and full truth. Guess what? He's long-suffering, he's patient, he's willing to forgive, he's willing to, to work with you. He's giving you time and opportunity, and we should make the best of it. You know, there's uh, a lot of opportunity to be able to study together. 
you know, I'm here, uh, you know, like four days out of the week. I'm usually here, you know, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays in the evening as well. But I'm available for studies. If anybody ever has a question, shoot me a text message. You know, the elders I know are the same way. I'm going to speak for them. You know, the deacons, I'm sure, are the same way. There's many, many members here who are willing to take the time to study. If you want to, just reach out. Let us know. We want to study with you. We want to, to, to build you up. That's one of the good things about the eldership here is that they want to build this congregation up. They want everyone to be equipped and ready to go out into the world to preach and to teach all the lost souls and to bring the members of this community, not necessarily, you know, to, to Christ. They, they, they want all of these individuals saved, just like Paul did. He says, I want to be able to, to, uh, to, to be like you guys, to, to, to come to a knowledge of you, to understand who you are, so that way I can teach you Christ, so that way some of you, at least some of you, can be saved. We're wanting all of these individuals in this community to be saved. But wouldn't it be good if we could at least get one more person saved? Two more people saved? A few more people saved? We want to be able to be equipped and ready to do that. And these are three things that can help us by doing that. So again, can you say those things? And I'm going to add one more. Tonight, if you're sitting there and you can't answer this question or that you, you can't say this, I am a Christian, would you like to? Would you like to be able to say that I'm a Christian? I hope that the answer is yes, and if it is, please don't put it off any longer. Please become a Christian today while, it, while we still have time and opportunity. We aren't promised tomorrow, but we do have this moment right here, right now, that you could become a Christian and that you could start growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have become a Christian and you find yourself uh, discouraged, you find yourself in sin, you need the prayers of the congregation for strength, don't hesitate. Let us know how we can help you. If you would like for us to pray with you, pray for you, then let us know that as well by taking a seat on the front as we stand and sing the invitation song.